Three, two, one. This is your Libertarian Crusader podcast number 10. Today, along with our fine Crusaders, we have joined with our fourth one, Jason Romano. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you found anarcho-capitalism? Oh boy, that's a long story. <laughs> <laughs> All right, condense it. <laughs> like one minute. Okay, so I first got interested in politics back in the 90s. I was pretty much your standard right-wing neoconservative. Um, I read National Review for a good part of a decade. Pretty much the best thing out of that was I discovered the Austrian school, learned the names Mises and Rothbard uh, in an article in National Review. Uh, in the late 90s, I read Human Action and Man, Economy, and State. Wow. And then I started reading some more Rothbard and Mises. And eventually I read The Ethics of Liberty by Rothbard. And that was the book that kind of like I had been leaning more and more libertarian up until then, but when I read that, I, it just clicked in my head. I said, okay, this is, this is the correct thing here. This right here is the correct thing. So that was the tipping point. And that was uh, late 2000, early 2000. So wait, after, after you read Man, Economy, and State and Human Action, you were like, Okay, I'm 50-50. Like <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> well, Most people would be like, no, I'm 100%. I, I have to be. I spent all this time. <laughs> well, the thing with man, economy, and state was I had read economics stuff uh, before then because I, I was one of my undergraduate majors was economics. So even the most far furthest right wing uh, economists will write a book on economic theory and they'll always say, even if they're extremely pro-free market, they always say, they always have the caveat that the government's purpose is to create the quote-unquote legal and political framework around which the market can flourish. So when I read Man, Economy, and State, I read it intending to hear that at some point, and I made it all 900 pages through the book, and Rothbard at no time said <laughs> that the government's purpose was to um, create the legal and political framework. You're like waiting for that to drop. I was waiting, yeah, I was waiting for that shoe to drop. <laughs> and it never happened. And I thought, okay, well, what's this guy about? I mean, I've heard stuff about him, you know. Uh, maybe I need to read more. And I read The Ethics of Liberty, and that was the one that, okay, I get it. I see, I see where he's coming from. So that was the book that pretty much, if I was, if this is anarcho-capitalism and this is state, this is the line, statism, anarcho-capitalism, and I was like right up against the line after reading Human Action and Man, Economy, and State. Uh, after reading The Ethics of Liberty, I was on the other side of the line. And I was like, okay, I believe this, but I have a thousand questions now. And then I just started reading whatever I could find. Um, pretty much every, every book I could, I could think of and could afford to buy. How big is your library? Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I don't even know. I would guess... Uh, close to a thousand books would be my guesstimate. Totally, guys. Wow. Eight hundred to a thousand. I think I did a rough est. I think I counted up the books I have in my apartment, and it was over five hundred. I think. Oh. I think. Don't ask me to help you move. Please. <laughs> yeah. no. And I have more. I have more packed up at my parents' place, like important ones, like um, the signed copies. Not the signed copies. <laughs> um, like uh, I have democracy the god that failed actually i don't have available to me um and there's some other ones mm. that oh um the enterprise of law by bruce benson i don't have that one at my fingertips that one's packed up somewhere it's mm. a really important book i uh, saw um rothbard's library they moved all of it to the mises institute uh, so you can walk through it all they have all the shelves and stocked as so many books uh, and all of them pretty much have his uh, notes written in them. Yeah. Do you write notes in yours too? No. No. Uh, but yes, it, r notes are written in them. You can uh, kind of preview it. And that's pretty much how his apartment was apparently. There's nothing but books, mm -hmm. stacks of it everywhere. Um, hmm. And somehow he was able to like cite these books from memory. That was like his ability. So like, like as there was a like, talk where mm. he was... Um, supposed to give a speech he forgot he's supposed to give a speech he's like he's at a big banquet he's like all right you know what uh, where's the typewriter i'll be back in two hours and uh <laughs> and he sat down at the typewriter and wrote down the entire speech with uh, citations uh with uh, footnotes uh yeah. with the bibliography at the end 
Wow. <laughs> Holy crap. Oh, from memory. Yeah, he was incredibly, he, he, like his body of work is tremendous. And the number of topics that he talks about yes. is just unlimited. It's insane. Yeah, his, he wrote uh, Conceived in Liberty. Have you guys heard of that? Mm -hmm. Conceived in Liberty, his four volume um, history of the U.S. like up until the revolution or shortly after. It's like it would be the magnum opus of any <laughs> Ph.D. historian. And it's just like, oh, he also did this. <laughs> right. Rothbard, it's like he has all these books on economics, all these books on politics. And yeah, he just wrote this four volume history of early American history. <laughs> yeah. Somehow fit that in somewhere. Oh. That's packed up. I don't have access to that anymore. All right. <laughs> Um, so we're going to do something fun with uh, yeah, our combined fun. knowledge and your library of knowledge. Uh, <laughs> just because I've read them doesn't mean I remember anything I've read. Okay? <laughs> just fair warning. We're going to attack a couple, couple of uh, common and cap questions. This is all going to be about criticism about anarcho-capitalism, libertarianism, mm -hmm. what about in a uh, stateless society sort of thing. And so we're going to go over something that's uh, new and recent given Hurricane Dorian. Uh, like wrecked Virginia. I, I saw a lawn chair knocked over in my <laughs> neighbor's yard. Yeah. Um, it, was it was overcast all day yesterday. Yeah, it was horrifying, right? I don't know if it was, was really going to rain. Yeah. yeah. Did you like keep the motorcycle in the garage? I looked at it longingly. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I was really <laughs> I depressed. You don't want to take those risks. Yeah. yeah. It yeah. was a solid 10% chance of rain. Right. Yeah. No way. Um, so we're going to go about price gouging. There's a lot of people that think, of course, that it's. Uh, a bad thing. I mean, the way even the way they, they word it, gouging, right? It's like that's something like you gouge someone's eye out. Uh, <laughs> someone should come up with a better name for this. Yeah. Um, providing resources when they are scarce so they don't deplete themselves immediately, right? <laughs> um, that's too long winded. I'm sure we can bro bro break that down in an acronym. Price serving. Price <laughs> helping. Price serving. Um, so, what is a. Uh, well, Uber calls it uh, surge pricing. Right, right. I mean, they just changed the language a little bit, and it's not called price gouging anymore. It's like, oh, there's a high amount of people that are looking for a ride right now. Looks like we got to up the prices. You call them something like busy rates. Right, yeah. Well, no, no. Right. That makes you just hate the people who would normally pay for these services, guys. Uh, I mean, how do, how do you answer that? Well, I mean, the, the initial problem is when you say price gouging, People are saying, well, okay, the prices are too high, but then if you're comparing prices to, you, in order to say that prices are quote unquote too high, you have to have some standard that you're comparing it to. And you can't, there is no objective standard that you can say, okay, it goes beyond this price, now it's too high. That's, well, that's the main problem. That's also the problem with monopoly prices. So it's the famous economist question compared to what? Yeah, exactly. Mm. Yeah, can you, that's kind of a question you want to compare everything. Uh, not just like here in the United States or situations or social problems. Like compared to what? To the rest of the world, I think, yeah. looking at the bigger Walter picture. Walter Block has a funny joke about that. And he's like, what do you ask the economists compared to what? How's your wife doing? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, that's where I got this from earlier this Walter week. Block, yeah. 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 <laughs> 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 uh, but they'll say, of course, you know... Um, Look, people want water, access to water, so it's a human right to have at least... Uh, Wasn't that what a hurricane supplies? Oh, shit. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Now that, now that you, I think about it, it's kind of ironic that a hurricane would cause a water shortage considering... Oh, I'm sorry, the government bans you using rain barrels. I stand right. for yeah. it. Some <laughs> sense, it makes yeah. perfect sense that there's a shortage of water. Right, of course. Um, but yeah, it does... Uh, well, they'll say the demand goes to where it's needed the most. And at the very least, you can get a couple bottles of water and not like the entire crate that most people would be apt to do. Um, and the same thing you can say towards uh, other resources. But uh, yeah, I mean, getting a rainbow barrel to get water would be kind of easy access. But what about things like um, gasoline? You know, there's a guy who was like filling up like 10 tanks of gasoline in his truck. Right. And there's a guy walking around in his megaphone trying to shame him uh, for doing something like that. Um, I guess he should be feel silly if he was doing this here in Virginia Beach, right? They never came and never hit. And what are you going to do with that extra right. Yeah. Nobody, yeah, and plenty of that happens all the time. Nobody ever says, oh, well, um, it looks like you got screwed over. You know, you bought right. way too much gas you didn't need. Now you got to sell it back probably for less because who wants to buy it from this random right. schmuck? So. And gasoline kind of goes bad after a couple months, so you don't want to hold on to that for a while. Um, but yeah, I think uh, that does kind of help assess the, the demand of any kind of product or good. 
Right. And the other thing is, anytime, say, somebody... Sorry. You're good. Uh, anytime somebody says, okay, I'm going to buy, like, 100 gallons of gasoline because I think a hurricane is coming... Um, I mean, one of the important things to remember is that what they're doing is they're speculating on the temporal aspect of the good. So they're saying gasoline isn't worth as much now, but gasoline five days from now is going to be worth a lot more because it's a lot more urgently needed. All right. So they're taking on that risk. This kind of goes to another weird area where they think like... Um well, I guess another word anchor question would be, uh, well, you don't have the state. You know, what stops someone from buying all the water bottles or someone buying all the coal or all of the, I don't know, lakes? This or- is, yeah, this is a funny one because it shows, it highlights their scarcity mindset. They think that there is a set pie, that there will be no technology that intervenes that makes it um, the market change in any way. When if you look at all of human history, it's, it, human history is the market being upset with new technologies, disruptors, if you will. It's always changing. People are up in arms about X censorship, but these companies are just showing that they're going to, you know, censor themselves straight out of existence because new technologies will emerge where people won't be censored. It's a scarcity sort of thinking that, uh, if you can buy all of one thing, you can create a monopoly. Because without the government to legislate a monopoly, right. there's natural competition. All right. Um, I guess we could bring up the um, <clears throat> candlelight that used to be used by <laughs> oil, by, by whales yeah. that they would acquire. And then, uh, yeah, you have a lot of hunting and all that stuff. And then he came a com- competitor that nobody really thought about. It was like, why don't we just get oil from the ground? And then you have psh, huge competition come out of that, right? And kind of change this whole, I don't know, monopoly of, you can say, on well hunting into another source that did a cheaper, efficient... Now only the Japanese do it. We're good. Right. <laughs> so, the, and that was another issue with gasoline. They were talking about prices of gasoline going up tremendously. And uh, since, the, like, you know, the 90s, fracking has become more prevalent. Or prevalent and that's, that's been developed. And so that's impacted the price that people would otherwise pay. And so... They, they just don't know. They don't know what's coming. And so they, they're fearful. And that's right. what people naturally do. Is they, they're just, they live in a state of fear. Like um, oiling closer to shore where there's better accessible to oil. Um, and, well, they're, they're fearful of like oil spills and stuff like that. But it, that usually happens way offshore, which is harder to get into. And a lot more risks, uh, a lot more dangers involved. Uh, but you have a uh, government uh, saying that you can't uh, buy this part of the area and get closer and make it easier accessible. I mean, there's tons of oil reserves here that they have, but none that they're allowed to dig up and extract. Well, that goes back to there's no property rights in the ocean. Right, yeah. Uh, Walter Block would say uh, if it uh, moves, uh, well, privatize, privatize it, it, right? <laughs> if it doesn't move, privatize, privatize it. Right. right. And the ocean. And most everything moves or doesn't move. <laughs> right. <laughs> And land is uh, uh, slow, like slow-moving water. Uh, the tectonic uh, plate shifts kind of slowly, so it is moving. So you could still, of course, homestead it, privatize it. Mm-hmm. Not so much you could do the same thing uh, with oceans. Um, I guess that draws into a weird area. It's like how much can you homestead on an ocean or even here on land? Or how far up into the sky do you homestead belongs to you, right? Can someone create a... A house uh, floats in the air on a cloud, for example, or build a, uh, an entire structure. I think this happened maybe to somebody who didn't want to sell the property, so they just built a casino right over their, <laughs> or their property. <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. The real estate development is rife with stories of people right. <laughs> taking poor choices and not selling. So. Right. But usually those comes with uh, the added costs of like eminent domain granted to them uh, right. through government. Right. So you don't really have these sort of things kind of happening in a regular market setting. Um, but yeah, I think um, a lot of these, I guess, criticism comes from people who think that it's, uh, we're, we're there, we're here at a post-scarce society. Um, any of you guys believe that? Sorry, really? <laughs> <laughs> they think we've produced so much of these water okay. bottles, we have all this machinery and robots, like this stuff can run itself automatically, we really don't have to do much manual labor. Wow, okay. I mean, automated. Yeah, well, no, I mean, my job is no. I gotta fix the things that break, so. You still got to fix the machines. Right. They don't fix themselves yet, as far as I know. <laughs> yeah. If only they did. Right. But well, then I would be out of a job. 
does AI robots do? People like, worry build themselves? too. Yeah, they're like, oh, what if I'm out of a job? Well, that'd be great. Because right? like, <laughs> right? what if my job never needs to be done? Think about all the implications that has. You know. <laughs> well, what I what I tell people when they get up, they get like all up in arms about AI taking everybody's jobs and like, okay, so the robots need to be built. Well, but we'll still build the robots. Well, what if they the robots build themselves and they can build everything else? And I said, well. My th- what I tell people is, look at it this way. You can get money through your job. You can get it. There's like, in economics, three different types of way to get income. There's uh, wage labor, interest and profit, and rent. So let's say you take you know, wage labor completely off the table. But if AI robots were like, if it got to a point where they can literally build everything, everything would be so cheap that let's say you could literally live, like all the prices for everything were so low that you could literally live off of the dividend payments from like one share of stock. Hmm. Like you own one share of any stock and the dividends are enough to like, you have a decent apartment, you can buy all your food, you can, because when you're thinking that far ahead to where AI is doing literally everything, you're, you're talking like probably centuries into the future. Well, where is, where is all the money being spent at if you're not paying labor? It's only being spent on natural resources and stuff like that. Right. So the price, ha- the floor has to drop through on the price. But how do we right. compete against a uh, robot zero one city? Right. Uh, the, the, don't, 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 I'm not familiar with it. Well, it's like the Matrix or like... Uh, the robots were kind of outcasted and then they went off to the desert and they're like, we'll grow to own city. Yeah. And they're like miles away in technology, I guess, <laughs> the humans and everyone else. And um, then they put well, us and they use us as batteries. Eventually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, they go to war with us. That's, That's a crusade. Yeah. I like to picture, well, yeah, there is your fourth crusade. Wait, <laughs> yeah. tenth crusade. Tenth um, crusade. So the, I like to picture that you basically have a free laborer just showing up to your job. You know, so like, what if you could just hire somebody to show up to your job for you? <laughs> and do it that's like what this would essentially that's the situation this would be and so great i can just stay home or i can ride my motorcycle all day i can just do whatever i want pretty much yes. like <laughs> pretty much yes do you think this could go into a place where a lot of uh people say well we don't need money because uh that was like one question someone was saying like money's a root of all evil that's just stuff you know if someone has a cow you have a chicken trade uh we don't need money uh it's uh i guess they'll say it's inefficient do you think Money still a place in a stateless society. Those people that have criticisms like that, I like to press them on their definition of what they define as money. Because if they're saying they want to trade chicken for a cow, they're just using the chicken and the cow as money. Right, as the medium. Right. Yeah. So I think that they probably just have not a solid definition of what money is. Yeah. I I think a lot of it is people don't want to dig into ideas and have jump to conclusions and don't want to dig into things. I think they're stuck with like our fiat currency. I think that's all that money could ever be. And they they don't know like the history of it. They don't know that there's been competing currencies. Mm -hmm. Uh, All this history has been like robbed of them by going through these like public schools. So they don't know like the true history of currency. So they think, yeah, this money sucks. And they hear sometimes like it's getting devalued and that's all they know. It's like, well, obviously money sucks. Why would we have had people are so married to this paradigm. They're, they're willing to say, oh, we need the government to like, give people $1,000 a month. And uh, it, because they, they think that you need income and the government needs income because how would they get tax dollars? Right. And it's, uh, it's, it's this weird like kabuki dance that they're doing in their heads. And you think, well, there, there, there goes the government. You don't need one if uh, you don't need an income. And they'll find other ways to extract more forceful, ugly ways probably to extract right. value out of it, the citizenry. Well, well, can they just keep printing their own money for them? Yeah, Yeah. I was going to say that's one of the um, bad consequences of the Fed was you're talking about people think, well, they need to get more money through income. That's one of the ways that the Fed, by through inflation, has like conditioned people to think, okay, your income has to continuously rise in order to just stay even. And that's a consequence of the government printing off more money and raising all the prices. Well, it's not just it's not just thinking that you as an individual, your income needs to go up. All, it goes all the way up to big businesses. If they're Everything. not growing, yeah. they're dying, they think. So right. it's like 
there's a lot of malinvestment going on. This is, feeds into the boom bust cycle, makes everything, you know. I like worse. how they, try, they yeah. try to trick people and think it's the cost of living expensive. Like you need your, your pay rate, you match uh, the consumers. They're the ones well, who are raising yeah. the prices, yeah. right? right? It's, uh, that's nothing to do with the government uh, lowering the value of it. Right, um, yeah. Ideally, wouldn't it be great if just prices went down as they should, uh, as you would expect in technology. That's never happened. <laughs> <laughs> that never happened right. we for can't. an entire century <laughs> in the 1900s. Right. And I was thinking, like, how did all these people afford like, these automobiles when they first came out? Right? Uh, maybe like a decade after that, it's like everyone's starting to replace their horse and buggy. Right. Um, and that's wild. Uh, so does uh, capitalism require government? No, I don't know. Do you want to buy something from me? <laughs> well, I don't know. Is it, is it regulated? Uh, I gotta, do you have your permit for it or your license? Papers, please. <laughs> <laughs> is it a government seal of approval for it? Are we trading government currency? I yeah, we don't even. Yeah, well, I'll trade you something that's not green. <laughs> <laughs> Piece of paper. Yeah, when you think about the most important purchases that you make in your life, when you buy a car or you buy a house or what have you. Yeah, or you pay for your kids' uh, health care or whatever. You, you These are, like, so important, and yet the government really doesn't, I mean, especially with buying a house, you would think that there would be some government representative to make sure that the, the sale went okay and, and was, everything was fair. No, they aren't there. Yeah. <laughs> You're there with, like, an attorney. That's right. it. Um, so even big things like that, we don't really need government involvement. Uh, I think the only one government involvement if, if uh, you need a license to drive your own car, right? Um, or marriage, but there's a, uh, what state is it? Alabama trying to get rid of government out of marriage altogether, right? I think uh, that's great, right? I mean, you don't need a third party to be involved in a private affair. Yeah, right. That sounds good. Right. <laughs> I think they're, they're trying to say sometimes that capitalism requires government because of um, maybe contract enforcement or disputes, like going to uh, a judge, for example. Sometimes these are government arbitrators to have to go to or the police will enforce those contracts uh, from the government and they'll say, well, therefore, see, you need a government. Capitalism requires the police, which requires the government, which requires taxation. But if you have centralized planning of them, they're always ripe with abuse. So uh, that's my criticism of that. If you have a centralized authority that provides the court system or provides the police, there is no competition, so no, like, that allows for the abuse rather than stops it, like what they think. Right. That's what I feel right. like. Well, yeah, you look at Jeffrey Epstein and the sweetheart deal that he got at first, and you're and like, then, wow, yeah. and, and there's no other way to fix that deal. The government did it, and it's done. Oh, and it's against the law that they wrote themselves, the, where <laughs> they have to inform the victims, and they don't inform the victims. Like they don't even follow their own rules, so right. well, when you have when you have a monopoly over the final authority of like the definition of property rights, then that monopolist is going to want to in define those rights to their benefit. That's the inherent problem with the government. It all comes back to that. So I've been re going back to a lot of Frederick Bastiat lately, and his he has a few super good criticism I think that falls into this he's like socialists would say if we don't think if we don't think the government what is it exactly if we're against the government funding of grain we don't want people to be fed if we're against government funding of education we don't want people to be educated and and then another one he has is the government is a great fiction which everybody endeavors to live at the expense of everybody else and so these people are advocating it for it because they find a benefit from it. That's what I feel like. Right. I think sometimes they conflate, conflate the um, private interest groups that do similar things that government does. The government, you can say, at one point uh, adopted and monopolized and created their own version. Like uh, the Pinkertons uh, were a private agency of investigation. Uh, the government um, used many of their services, and then they passed laws to outlaw them in many areas so they can create the Federal Bureau of Investigation. And yeah. so, yeah, so they, they, they liked it so much, they want to create their own, like Lysander Spooner's... Uh, um, American Mail Letters Company. Right. Also, Friendly Societies and their Lodge Doctors right. were yeah. 
you know, I actually just finished reading a book called The Voluntary City that goes over a lot of stuff. You were mentioning uh, police and defense services like that. Uh, there were two areas that the book was really big on saying these things were being done privately and it was simply a matter of the government not like stepping in and saying, okay, nobody's doing this, we need to do it. It was like, they're doing this, but we want to take it. And that was education and, uh, and police. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, there were police organizations um, privately being um, providing that service and then the government just stepped in and were like, nope, ours now. <laughs> This, yeah. I think it's on the rise and, again, yeah. though, if you look at like Detroit threat management, and then there's a lot of yeah. um, there's a lot of Jewish community policing and Arab or right. Muslim community policing. So the pendulum might be swinging back a little bit. Hopefully, yeah. We need a crusader policing. I like know. this idea. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just a guy wearing like chainmail, yeah. walking around, <laughs> determining whether there's a lot of threats in the community. I mean, I don't know. Right. Right. I like this idea. I'd, I'd be the first assignment. You could be the guy. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> we got to bring some more squires upon. <laughs> yeah. um, so what about warlords? That's another common one. They'll say that. They're a great time. They're fun. What? No, <laughs> um, in a stateless society, uh, Somalia. You, were Somalia taken over uh, the United States, I guess? Well, no, maybe. Everybody knows that if you're an ANCAP, your real home is Somalia <laughs> and that you, you really love warlords. That's your main political system that you advocate for. Uh, in Kapistan. Right. Yeah. Um, and I guess they don't really realize, I guess when we actually look at the facts and stuff like that, Somalia was doing tremendously well when they didn't put a government together. And it took them like a whole decade to do that. Uh, literacy rate was going up. Their own income was going up. Uh, infant mortality rates and stuff like that were going down. I think the individual knew that they had to do it themselves because there wasn't this quote unquote safety net to rescue them. It's like, oh. My life's my responsibility to the up month, the upteenth degree. I have to, I have to learn to read. I have to get some skills. Otherwise, you know, I am subject to what's going on around me. Right. You're not being bred into uh, being dependent on government to do it for you. Yeah. And then they don't talk about like why Somalia became the way it was and why people had to do that in the beginning right. with. Right. I mean, there was a government before. What happened to it? <laughs> right. Um, embroiled civil wars, uh, a lot of uh, inhumane things were going on. And then when they started bringing Somalian security forces in and putting that together, they started raping people. Uh, first, like news outlets started coming out against that. So it wasn't like a really happy thing for everybody seeing a government coming back in. Um, yeah. But yeah, I guess a lot of people don't look, when you look at warlords uh, maybe coming in, they're thinking that without the military here, uh, we would have no means to defend ourselves or to uh, approach such a situation like here in Virginia in case there is a warlord coming from uh, Nebraska or something. Uh, what do we do, right? I guess we just sit here at the, you know, like our ancestors did at the Revolutionary War and yeah. do nothing, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I think they well, kind of fought back. The thing, the thing with the whole warlords argument that's kind of like twisted on its head, it's when you actually press people to describe what bad things the warlord is going to do to you, it's like, okay, so the government already does this. <laughs> I mean, the whole point of warlordism is to have, you know, people that you can steal their resources. That's reason. the whole point. It's right. like long-term, it's, it's like, okay, well, we could, you know, when pillagers figured out, well, if we didn't just come by every few years and pillaged everything they had if we stayed integrated and into society them, yeah integrated ourselves into here and just pillaged them gradually over a period of time and we'll keep the other pillagers away but we'll still take our cut you know everything that they're describing that the warlords are going to do that we should be afraid of it's already being done to us it's like 40 to 50 percent of our income is already taken from us they can kill us whenever they want, pretty much. I mean, I mean just look at like people. Waco and obviously the anniversary yeah. of Ruby Ridge. Ridge. And these are people who, well, for a moment, they step out against the government and just watch yeah. what happens to them. So, um, Waco he, or uh, Ruby Ridge, he was running away. Like he was in the most rural place he could get to. They yeah. came to him. Yeah. <laughs> they yeah. seek you out. But look at uh, the Bunny Ranch situation, right? Now that we have like the media following this kind of out there and anyone with the phone is part of the media now you can say um, this first time ever where you have uh, 
civilian sightings aiming down at the government and the government backing off. And I think because, uh, like you were mentioning about property rights, like they can, they'll try to monopolize the definition, but when this situation is all about property rights, like they're not going to win that argument. Uh, so I think it's different if like uh, the people took over that wildlife refuge, the government center, they can say, oh, they're trespassing. Now we can go after them. But uh, it's private land, and that's something that everybody can come along and like uh, wave a flag for um, and approach. And you see them lined up on the highways with their gun sights on government agents, and the government isn't firing back. I think that's an interesting, I don't know, era that we're in now in hmm. terms of... Um, the internet you know it's like yeah. media shining a light on it you know. yeah it's, it's like accountability uh, right yeah. to a, a high level it's like hong kong right now um the tanks aren't rolling in because hong kong has a lot of cell phones <laughs> and hong right. kong and china doesn't want to look that bad in the event they want to do another uh, olympics you know that's not going <laughs> to look well on their bid of uh, reputation all right um so i think we're living in an interesting age in which diplomacy is like hard like the only thing they can start using seems to be i think we're kind of done with the whole nation conquering for the most part hopefully hopefully yeah but on a minor counterpoint you know you're talking about everybody having a cell phone unfortunately there i still see a lot of like police like literally killing people on camera and then you find out six months a year later oh they were they weren't even you know taken to trial it's like they literally have video of the guy murdering someone, and not that he's not he doesn't even stand trial. So, I don't know. Yeah, I like, share your optimism, yeah. but but I think it's trending in the in the better direction. I, yeah, yeah, and that's what I would agree. That, yeah, we're hell like because we live in our we're humans. We're caught in a constant present. So, the more you can look back in the past, the the better. Uh, representation a better map you have of the territory yeah. of going forward yeah i agree I, yeah like i said i agree with it with cal's optimism and what you say i'm just saying still right. one way to go <laughs> yeah right yeah. well because yeah. that's the biggest thing is these people have these criticisms of ancapism because they think that they have to have there has to be one big bad dude in the room to keep everybody else they don't have the respect for other humans like oh i deserve freedom but i need to like respect other people's right to have freedom as well because one my theory is sometimes people think that other people are so bad that they think oh if you don't have a thumb on humans they'll act out which that is the case for some the hobbesian view right right yeah it's uh i don't know i'm more of let me have my freedom i'm not going to interfere interfere with yours then that touches down on our uh, next question about is culture important? And uh, I think a lot of those areas in which like respecting each other's freedoms, it's uh, very much he- heavily ingrained in a people's culture. I think uh, the American culture or European culture is heavily intertwined with that. Or what are freedoms, right? Right. They're into what are the freedoms that I should respect? So right. If a woman wants to walk outside wearing that. X, Y, Z, right. you know, should I respect that? Or is that a freedom for us? Who knows, right? Right. There's some cultures that stone women for walking out like that. There's some where we're here, we just make a comment. Um, <laughs> there's uh, some, for example, when I was looking at reading the, the not so wild, wild west, right? People think like property rights is something that comes from government and without them putting their high courts, like nobody knows what it is. Uh, but no, it's, it was a big cultural thing here for Americans before they went out west to settle on those ranges, mining camps, um, cattle ranches, or anywhere out west. Uh, before they went out together, they had contracts with each other and how they were resolved their, uh, their, their, their disputes. Uh, so they had private covenants, they had private uh, contracts with each other. There was like a mining town, for example, that had this uh, big court case in which there was a dispute between these two guys. and part of the uh, contract said if there's a dispute that you can't reach any kind of a resolution, you can split it up. And so that's what ended up happening. In the same city, uh, it became technically like two towns <laughs> of two people because mm-hmm. uh, they didn't agree with this contract, and, but it allowed a way for them to amicably mm-hmm. separate but still live together. Right? And I, I think the wagon trains also had, con- like, because it took a long time to get out there, so the wagon trains would pretty much be what most people would consider like little mini governments 
because you know you had this group of people that was traveling all the way across the country, so they had to set up some rules ahead of time. And I mean, the government didn't set those rules up. It was pretty much set up by the people that were um, running that wagon train. Right. So it's just another example of where you know people, private individuals, are doing what supposedly we need the government to do. Right. You mentioned that because you brought up the wild, wild west. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I mean, they, they piggyback on stuff that uh, civilization creates, right, and produces. And the government's like, oh, that's a good idea. We'll adopt it too. All right. Uh, and this is stuff that uh, I think culture wise, uh, Europeans have, have done really well in, in creating a culture that respects property rights um, and that nature. Maybe because it's an environmental thing and creating this. I was talking with my girlfriend about uh, low and high time preferences. And, uh, and uh, this is what you guys do over, <laughs> over drinks. So, babe, I want to go out and get some dinner and uh, <laughs> let's talk some time. Well, we, we were hearing about uh, Michael Malice's interview with uh, Hapa. Uh, I had no idea he had him on. Oh, and wow. then uh, they were talking about his um, the promise he had uh, at this university about time preferences. So I was explaining to her about what the, that was a little bit more about. Um, and I was thinking, like, where this sort of stuff kind of originates from. Europe deals with a lot of harsh climates and a lot of harsh weather. It might be an environmental thing for Europeans to kind of have to gradually have to adopt. You have to, uh, you don't have steady summers, right? It's like you have winters coming in. So you got to save stuff. You got to think about the long term. You got to uh, create a low time preference culture, I imagine, how maybe a lot of this stuff kind of arises from. Um, I'm sure you've read a lot of the stuff on that, right? What are your thoughts I on have, that? I mean, I've heard some about that. I haven't looked into it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not used to talking into this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I've read a lot about time preferences, um, the whole like cold climate versus warm climate. I haven't really looked into. I'm somewhat skeptical, but I don't want to make a definitive like statement one way or the other. All right. Um, but yeah, I mean... The, the point about time preferences being important is, I mean, I would definitely agree with that. Um, you know, the more forward looking you tend to be, that generally leads to more long term productivity. But I would also say as long as um, as long as whatever the level of time preference is, is voluntarily chosen, um, like like if you have a society where people tend to prefer like current leisure to future productivity. I mean, from a utilitarian standpoint, you can't determine that one is better than the other. It's like when you take a vacation, you know, you're not productive for, for like a week or two or however long you're on vacation. You know, technically you're sacrificing productivity for that, for, yeah. for present, you know, for present enjoyment. So, um, yeah. But you but can look at, yeah. I was gonna say, you can look at maybe other pl places that give you a long vacation um, subsidized by the state. France. Oh, well, uh, France. Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> go to one is France. Yeah. Uh, like, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, climate's of... an obvious thing that forces you to look at time preference, is I think purely the argument. If you know that you only have a certain amount of time to grow your food and you have to stretch it to get through this harsh time, that brings it to the forefront of your mind regardless. So you have to plan people, ahead. Yeah, it weeds out the people exactly. who didn't. Right. Yeah. right. And so I think uh, appreciation for that comes about maybe in a culture of uh, maybe saving capital and those kind of places will be very successful uh, historically with capitalism. Uh, and with that will come a lot more evolution of terms like contracts and economics. Or, is, our, uh, is our society, though, really entering a extremely high time preference phase i mean it seems like i mean just the united states we we give a credit card for every virtually every payment our government pays for everything with debt <laughs> we're a debt-based society it, sometimes it seems like everybody wants it now you know we're, we're consumption based oh yeah the fed i mean that well that's one of the bad things about the fed is by yeah. devaluing the dollar you know that the dollar is going to be worth less a year from now than than it is now so that incentivizes people to spend now versus spending later right that's that's a bad thing mm -hmm. right um and then you have uh i guess other areas in which they will subsidize that like maybe through welfare and or sometimes even uh you can find this in like maybe government agencies where they'll give you here's a thousand dollars for example 
And they say, okay, we only used uh, $800. Uh, if we don't spend the other $200, it looks like we don't need it. Uh, and so I don't know if that's a good example of it, but I guess another way of like wasting it as fast as they can uh, so they can secure a budget for next year. Um, or you can look at, uh, yeah, welfare is another one. It uh, disincentivizes people to actually create a natural uh, time preference than they would otherwise. Uh, why save, right? If, they, right. if, they, if it shows I have a lot of money or I'm holding a lot, it also shows that, uh, that I'm doing well, that I don't need a handout mm -hmm. or from government, right? Um, I think uh, cultures that have that and people moving in from other cultures can adopt that and learn that. There is a Native American group, the Lumbee tribe, I think in North Carolina, right? Lumbee's in there? I think so. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, the only Native, <laughs> they're, <laughs> they're the only Native American group that is not recognized by the United States government and thus gets no federal grants or money or anything like that. But they are the most successful Native American group in the entire country. They have their McMansions, they own banks, they own businesses. They're the most well-off economically than all the other Native American groups. Wow. And, and they've, they've adopted um, low time preference and they're able to learn from that. And so I think government messing with uh, culture's ability to adopt that uh, infringes on them and they do poorly in, in those outcomes. Um, so yeah, in terms of is culture important, I think culture is important. I don't think all cultures are equal. I think there's uh, stuff we can glean from all the cultures, but I think in terms of like wanting to create a high trust society in which we can have these values that we can share, I think that's kind of important. Um, I think uh, multicultural stuff kind of creates a lot of problems. Um, yeah, it's almost worse. Multiculturalism is almost worse than just encouraging people's differences, you know, encouraging people to be more committed to their differences rather than this sort of panacea of um, we're going to celebrate everybody's stuff, you know. Right. It, it, it's discouraging, it seems like, especially it well, hasn't worked out in Europe. You know? I think it's a Trojan horse, just like they take these words, like the, the labels of racist or homophobe, and they just throw them out there so crazy. And just like multiculturalism, they throw it out there so crazy. They don't even define it or say right. anything about it. We're interested in what is the best ideas or what is the best thing to move us forward you know, we're trying to look, analyze everything and look at it what works best. But uh, these people are just about forced inclusion. It's more authoritarian than anything. Oh, right. If you don't agree with our group, we're going to use every, every trick in the book to go against you. So we get things like call-out culture or... Twitter bans. Yeah, like, yeah. It, it's, uh, I think that... <clears throat> it's going to eat itself, though, was going to be hilarious, and uh, we'll be able to move past it, but it's going to, a lot of people are going to get eaten up in the wake, unfortunately. Right. So let's, I have a slightly different take. Yeah. Um, I don't think so much multicultural, uh, multiculturalism per se is as much the issue as state enforced multiculturalism i think that's like the main thing because i mean i i'm sure you guys are the same way i mean i associate with people of like all different types of cultures pretty much every day right and it, in day-to-day -day private interactions it's like there's no issue i think the issue the main issue is when the government steps in and says we're going to force this on everybody well, because then you get factions within you've got like you know you've got different cultural groups that are that are trying to get the government to say okay well we like living this way so we want the government to force everybody to live this way well if you look at what's so, like what's going on in europe right now there's a whole bunch of muslims in there and then there's the feminists and stuff that are trying the the alphabet people that are trying to push that sort of education in the education system now there's a whole backlash the muslims right. are protesting the public school system because they don't want their kids to be forced to be taught this Somebody the problem's force too, yeah. i think right yeah, yeah I, I i'm pretty much i'm mostly agreeing i'm right. just yeah i yeah. i would say my takeaway from that is like why the government shouldn't be running the schools that's the that's the main problem right that's where it all comes yeah. from is it, that really is you talk about that all the time but public Dave, school system is my favorite Dave smith always talks about how he has a ride he he calls an uber from a 
Muslim guy, and the Muslim guy picks him up, and he's a Jew. And <laughs> if if they really had to hash it out, they might disagree on virtually everything. But just because they're working together for this common aim, the, the Uber driver wants the money and he wants the ride, it's like well, society functions just fine. It's and, a beautiful thing. And that's multicultural. That's like multiculturalism that we like. But we, we get this other version and from the government and, and the educational system. And, right. Multiculturalism uh, via consent always seems to work. I right. prefer um, coming here, even regardless of where they're coming from, but adopting Western culture. Because obviously, if they love their country so much, they would have stayed there. They're coming here for a reason because we have things here in our culture that is far better than their country that they're leaving it from and coming here. And I think it's when they do come here to adopt it and to embrace it and to share it and to uh, champion it. Uh, because it is, it's a very unique place that not all the, over the world has it. Not all the world has a Second Amendment thing. Not all the world has uh, the, way that we, the way we treat each other, uh, the way we view how we should be. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, even going walk, walking down the streets of India, I won't say too much about it, but you know, there's a lot of places you can't even walk on. But I think um, the West are the best, and I think uh, if you're coming here, you should adopt that also mantra, saying the West are the best, and let us continue making. Wait, do you the have West. to become a proud boy in order to come here? <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, a lot of problems are coming here, where people are saying like the West is not the best. It's creating a lot of these problems, and they're forgetting the history and the things that created these conditions for why uh, they left their home country to come here, right? Um, obviously, if their home country was good, they wouldn't have left, right? There's a reason why they're, they're here to begin with. And I like to keep this awesome experiment that we're having. Uh, it's a very, you know, we see what's happening in Europe and they're starting to lose that in some places. I don't want that light to fizzle out here because everyone's thinking Well, that. recently in the news, of course, right? Ilan yeah. Omar got some flack for, uh, I guess Trump called her out for uh, she's very negative and she doesn't appreciate what, what she's been given here and and to some extent I think Americans do see that like as a as a problem like they see oh man like you you came from a terrible place and now you're here and it's so much better here and yet also th there's from her perspective she's probably saying yeah I know I know but I still want to be able to criticize this place too, right? Well, and it's kind of like the the when status say to us, "Well, why don't you move to Somalia?" <laughs> it's kind of like that, sort of in reverse. Like, why don't you move to Somalia versus why didn't you stay in Somalia? Sort of deal. It's kind of the same thing. I think there's there's rooms for criticism, and there's rooms for like appreciation for it. And I think for someone like Omar. There's nothing but negativity and like venom that comes about her and her view about anything about America. Um, I would never want to live in Bolivia. I think it's sound like a <laughs> yeah. That place is a horrible place. My mother doesn't want to go there either or <laughs> retire there. It's uh, um, I wouldn't even want to visit myself. I've had a lot of bad memories there. So I love it here. I think this is a great place, and I like to keep it that way and make you sure it, uh, I pass on that tradition and torch of Western tradition. Um, we're catching up to it. We had a point about that. Uh, I think that as long as we're open to criticism, it's it's intellectual honesty yeah. is where it is. And there's a lot of people that if people show no gratitude, uh, if they can't say, oh, at least I'm in a place where I can criticize or things like this. If they don't have that sort of intellectual honesty, I don't tend to weight their criticisms very much. But if they're like, oh, this place gives me the ability to speak out, I've thought about this a lot. I think that if, if they offer an alternative, then people are more likely to like, oh, okay, I'll listen to what you say. But the media runs this narrative. It's like, oh, people are so dumb. We have to censor people because otherwise people would go with Sandy Hook was a fucking staged event and all this stuff. Wait, so what? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so well, Alex Jones is right about it. I don't know what you're talking about, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um... The only what they say the only privilege you have when you come here is uh, your income goes up over a thousand percent than where you came from, right? <laughs> right. I think that's a great testament right. about what we have going on here versus everywhere else. Um, the last question we're going to go over is a uh, fun one. What about <laughs> what about the roads, guys? Is it, you guys hate roads? Is that why you guys are trying to go for a stateless society? We do. Who's going to provide that? Roads. Yeah. I despise roads with every fiber of my being. That's why I'm an anarcho-capitalist. I want to see all of them destroyed. Thank Every, you. Same. Right. Yeah. yeah. Quote, Everybody should have a helicopter. To quote Eric July, fuck them ho-ass roads. <laughs> <laughs> Where are my magic carpets? Uh, where's my flying machines? 
a hovercraft, right? That's the Jetsons know. promised me. Right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's, there's way more options than just roads and, and cars. Technically, they said, like, the government is holding back technology for 40 years of the cell phone technology that could have been released much earlier, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and then imagine, like, all the, the stuff they're kind of holding back in terms of maybe transportation or engines. And, of course, if you monopolize the roads, you control whatever technology. Everything that can go on there. Right. Uh, there's a lot of stuff, for example, in Europe, they have a lot more leeway with a lot of, like cool lights that you can have and different efficiencies, but it doesn't make its way here because there's a way of, uh, I don't know, there's interests that go against it. I think there's, there's all of this potential, and yet you know, when, you look out, when you look into history and you look at the difficult times people had to go through, like being a serf in the Middle Ages or something or, or what have you, you're like, okay, I mean, we had to get through that difficult period in order to get to today. And some people might look back someday and be like, man, he had to ride that motorcycle instead of like riding an air cycle or something. You know, <laughs> like, and life must have been so terrible back then. And now it's so much better. And so like, yeah, I would think like maybe we just have to get through this difficult time of dealing with roads, you know. I don't think it's going to be a difficult time uh, because, I mean, roads were privately provided, you know, back before the government started stepping in. This is another thing that I, I covered. Um, I made, well, you guys know I made some videos covering the, the voluntary city. And one of the things that there was a chapter on was the interstate associations uh, back in the 19th century. And it was pretty much people in various communities would put their resources together to build these interstates. And the, the really interesting thing about them was uh, they didn't make any money off of it. They weren't profitable. And it's one thing if they went in thinking, oh, we're going to make a fortune off of building these interstates, uh, and then they don't. But it was known going in that these people weren't going to make any money. They just weren't a good investment, and yet they did them anyway. Hmm. And there were two main things that they said were the, the cause, like the supporting um, attributes that allowed this to happen. One was um, secondary benefits, like if there's a road connecting city to A to city B, then the property values in both of them go up. And the other thing was, and this was the main thing that they pointed out, was there was a lot of uh, social pressure. A lot of like social status was tied up in these things. So what would happen is people would go to like wealthy and prominent individuals in a community and say, you know, you should really support this road because, you know, everybody will think really highly of you and this will like up your social status. So it be, sort of became a thing for people to be known as, you know, mm. people that contributed to these interstate associations that built these roads. Um, and that, that's just one example. The other, the other thing is like uh, private communities have been built for you know, centuries, and usually what would happen is, like, the neighborhoods would build roads, or businesses like shopping complexes would build roads, because obviously, if if people can't can't come to your your shop, they can't buy your stuff, well, okay, I was going to say, nowadays, you can order it over the internet, but it also relies on being, (laughs) but then again, Amazon has the drones, so maybe we don't need them, anyway. But you can, like, wear clothes, and, you know, I like to fit, make sure the shoe fits, and all that stuff, and, like, the jacket's going to look good when we go in there. (laughs) I think what would happen as, you know, so, like, I work in real estate development, and I notice that when these projects are planned, they are planned, you know, very detailed, heavily, like, there's roads, (laughs) <laughs> that are being built by the developer so that home builders can build homes on, on it and it's all figured out and yeah the the local government ha- has to have an input on it i guess for some reason but i think that you would see cities being planned you know you would see like a, a billionaire saying this is my city these are the roads this is how it's going to work and this is going to be the transportation system and and this is gonna i'm going to work with a bunch of other rich guys and they would foot the bill, and um, yeah, they would own a lot of it. But you know, we would we would all benefit. And right. Well, I think it, it's fine if they own it, as long as if I pay my share, that I get to be able to use it as contracted to me. As long as everything is out in the open and laid out properly, this is the problem I have with the censorship and stuff like that. It's, there are no clearly delineated rules to tell anybody. 
you're fucking walking around in a minefield. You never know when you're going to step on something. It's the worst. Uh, that, I think that's it's the worst kind of system you can make. All right. Yeah, shopping centers already make the roads. There's private gated communities. And here in Virginia, it's businesses that make the roads. Uh, they're just subcontract- subcontracted by the government. Uh, right. So you're not even allowed to choose your contractor. They do the bids, and sometimes they're politically connected, and uh, they're the ones who get those, those contracts. Talk about, I mean, that's been in the news a lot lately with Mayor Stoney and right. polit- politically with connected people. Yeah. yeah. So it, it's is not. Is this the mayor pretty. of Richmond? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, he's trying to get so a Coliseum. I have no idea belt. who this person is. Right. He's <laughs> the one that smells. That's my. <laughs> that I believe it. He came it. driving here through that Richmond. That makes perfect sense. It's yeah. the stench of the local government. <laughs> right. Yeah. I don't know why I didn't think of that. I sh- that should have been my go to. <laughs> It's like, your politicians smell like crap up here. What's going on? <laughs> Not that ours smell like perfume, but good grief. Right, right. <laughs> um, well, that's our episode. Thanks so much for yeah. coming out here, Jason. Thank you. Uh, with that, uh, stay liberated. Get off my property. Stay out of school. Don't do drugs. <laughs> or do drugs. Stay in drugs. Don't do school. Stay in drugs. <laughs>